All right, well, good morning. Why don't you look at a couple of people, tell them run to win. Look at somebody else, tell them run to win. If you're in your living room right now, look at yourself and tell yourself to run to win or maybe somebody that's there with you. Listen, we are going to run to win this year. We are not running to lose. Sometimes we feel like we're running to lose. Sometimes we feel like, man, in this race, we're in the rat race or we're in some other kind of of marathon or race. But there is a race that God has called us to be a part of. And we are just kicking off this year, uh, man, just making sure we uh, we have set our priorities right, that we are making sure we're running in the right race. Uh, Running is not an option. We're going to run. And for those of you who are like, no, I would rather sit. Or I'm not a runner. We're talking just relax. People have already left because we said running. This this is spiritual. This is running our spiritual race. And, And I just want you to understand, running a spiritual race is not an option. You just got to decide what race you're gonna run. Like you may feel like, well, I just don't care. Or, or uh, even the atheist that says, I don't even believe there's a God. They are running a race. What we, what we get to decide is that we're gonna run the race that he, that our creator has set out for us. And in that race, you were not created to lose, you were created to win. God doesn't create losers. He creates winners. And let, let's look at our, our scripture for this series. Paul says it very clear, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. He says, don't you realize that in a race, everybody runs, say everybody. It says, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. Run to win. Run to win. And so I'm just declaring over your year, and I want by the end of this, the end of this day perhaps or the end of the next few weeks that, that your paradigm, your worldview is, man, I'm going to win. I'm going to win the day. I'm going to win the moment. I'm going to win in my marriage. I'm going to win with my kids. I'm going to win in the area of finances. Come on, somebody that spent too much at Christmas. I'm going to win in every area of my life. And it's not so that I can be the winner at the end. Okay, because I don't like to lose. There is a thing inside of me that just goes, you know what? I want to be the best. And if I'm not going to be the best and beat my family at Monopoly, I'm not going to play. I don't want to play games. Why? Because I I figured it's something out about myself. It's because I only like to play the games that I win. But we're not going to stop when we don't feel like we're winning spiritually. We're just going to lean in and we're going to run. Paul says, I don't run on my own. I don't run by myself. I'm not running for God. But nine, the, the same chapter, but in the, but the, 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 so 24 is the verse that we just read. But all the way at the very beginning of the chapter, he says, don't you guys understand that I have met with God face to face? And that I continually walk with him. So in the traditional uh, translation, it doesn't say continually, but we understand just by the grammar that, that it means, it's not just that Paul said, I have met with God one time, or that I met with him a long, long time and I'm running because of that. I don't want to run my spiritual race in light of God, with the knowledge of God. Knowledge isn't enough, it just makes you have a fat head. But knowledge, the understanding of God with the relationship with God means that every single day, no matter what I face, I don't face it alone, I face it with Jesus. It matters no matter what is happening in the economy, no matter what is happening in the government, no matter what, and and like my granddad taught me, come hell or high water, whatever I face, I'm gonna be face to face with Jesus first and foremost. Can I just tell you, even in my own race with the Lord, we face some things and then we want to sit on the sidelines. Or we think because of something that we've done or, or maybe I, 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 something's happened like Jesus saved me but then he went up into the stands and he's watching me run my race by myself. That's called deism. It's a whole theology that says that God created the world and then he left it to watch it. That's not God. That's not the God we serve. He is right in the midst of everything you're going through. Man, last night where you were deep in depression and you barely made it to church today, he was right there in that moment. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You're struggling with addiction? Guess who you'll find at the bottom of the bottle? Well, no, no, no. We got to get ourselves cleaned up. We got to get free of that before we can meet Jesus. But I wonder how many people could testify that right in the middle, I was high as a kite and Jesus met me right there. Now, do we get high as a kite so we can meet Jesus? Don't get crazy. 
Don't be justifying addiction. Well, that's where I find him. No, no, no. That's where he found you to rescue you and to pull you out of that stuff and to say, I've got better for you. Not for you to wallow around and, and, well, this is the way I was raised or this is just who I am. No, no, no. Those are all reasons why we take off our shoes and stop running and stop racing. And can I just tell you, dads, your kids need you to run your race. Bosses, your, your, your employees and your realm of influence need you to run your race. Don't quit. Don't stop. Well, he didn't say me, so if I'm a wife, I don't need to run my... no. You need to run your race. If you're 60, you need to run your race. If you're 90, you need to run your race. If you're 13, you need to run your race. There's an assignment and a purpose on your life. And Paul says, listen, run. And if you're going to run, run to win. Can I just tell you, sometimes even as Christians, we get up on Monday to hope we just make it through the day. We don't run to win. We run not to lose. Some of us in our relationships, man, we're just trying to put forth enough effort not to lose so he won't leave or she won't leave. Can I just tell you, that stinks. That's not the life that he he paid for. That's not what he's invited us into. He's invited us in a race and a life that we actually win. And listen, Paul really did meet with Jesus face to face. One day, you and I will too. We'll get to see him in heaven face to face. But, but that part of our race will be over. There's an assignment here through a relationship with Jesus that you can run and you can win. And so we're just declaring over our year. We're just deciding. I don't care if anybody else, nobody else may decide not. They, I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> everybody else may be doing their own thing. But I ain't worried about everybody else. I'm making a decision in my heart that I'm going to run to win no matter what. I don't know what's going to come. But he does. He's been there. He's laid out something for me. And he didn't lay it out so that I would lose. He didn't, ra- he didn't lay it out so that I would, de- I would be depressed in March. That I, w- that I would be frustrated in September. I turned 40 this year. I'm going to run for Jesus more than I've ever ran for him in my life. My kids say, Dad, you're halfway dead. I said, you guys are morbid. But, man, I'm going to keep on going. And whether I feel like it or whether I look like it or what what it looks like around me is not going to determine my posture and my attention. I am going to look up and I'm going to look ahead this year. The most important thing you can do this year, out of all the things that we want to do in the next 12 months, the most important thing you can do this year is look up. Paul said, I run my race. I run to win. You should too. But he said, we're going to do it not because of what we're going to do for God, not because it's in light of God, and I met him, and I had this encounter one day. No, he said, every single day, day to day, God, and and what is that? It's this fear, the, the, the healthy fear, not being afraid, but it's this respect and reverence of the Lord that I don't want to take one step without you. Well, how would your year look different if you just said, I don't want to make one decision without you, Lord. I don't want to make one step without you. I need you. I want you, and we really do mean it, and we really do run our race with him. He says, I haven't had a, he says, haven't I had this personal encounter with Jesus face to face, and I continue to see him. So let's talk about looking up. This is, uh, this will be really helpful for uh, the 2% of you that really do like running, because this will help you physically too in in your running. Um, But but they say that one of the the techniques of running is that you, you need to make sure you look up that you actually lift your head up. And when you physically look up, and I don't know the exact science behind it, but it releases, it, it brings alignment to your spine, and it releases uh, the chemicals, it releases strength to the rest of your body. And, and here's what I mean, I, I kind of know this from experience because I run some, and, and, and what happens is through fatigue and, and uh, just boredom sometimes, we have a tendency to look down. So where we're, we're running like this, all of a sudden we'll begin to look down. And some of it's gravity, some of it is just, it's, it's fatigue, and you start looking down like this. And so check this out. When you see people really sweating like they've been running a lot, when you see them running on the road and stuff, notice their, their posture. An experienced runner knows to force themselves to intentionally make the decision to look up. 
Looking up will not always come natural, but you have to intentionally make a decision to look up so that what begins to happen, it's because of the results. Then all of a sudden there's alignment, there's agreement in your body. You are actually physically designed to run. I actually learned this the other day. Uh, uh, there was a trainer talking to me about running, and they said, do you know that, that if the more you run, the older you get, you don't get worse at running, you actually get better. Because the more you do it, you're, it's muscle memory in your body. And I was like, sometimes I feel like I'm getting worse. Like, I can go, you know, I can't go as far as I would. And he said, no, no, no. It's, it's, it, we have been taught that the older we get, the worse it gets. Even spiritually, that, that our fire goes, that, that it wanes, that it will go out. We've been taught this, uh, that, that it doesn't get better, it gets worse. And so especially physically, well, I got wrinkles, so that means I can run less. I, 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 I can't keep up with, with you know, this. I can't do what I, I used to do. And some of that may be true, but when it comes to running, we're actually designed, because here's the deal, you were designed to run after that cauliflower, kill it, cook it, and eat it. All those cauliflowers that run around, you know? You know what I'm talking about? I'm picking on the vegans in the room right now. No, you, you were designed, and, and I'm going all the way back, and you say, okay, this sounds kind of prehistoric. No, no, it goes all the way back. You were designed to run after your food. I, I don't know if you noticed, but the, 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 this was different than the cows we feed, and they're just like, you know, they're just waiting on you to eat them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about poor cows. Let's just say a little prayer for the cows. We have cows at our house, and we pull in, and, and, and Amy sees them, and she goes, oh, aren't those sweet cows? And I'm thinking, mm. Because they're the black ones. You know what that means, right? Yeah. Tender. Mm. I mean, I'm stomach's growling, pulling in. I'm thinking, oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. She's thinking, oh, sweet little cows. This one's named this. This one's named this. I'm like, that one's named dinner. That one's named supper. That one's named, I mean, I'm getting, you know, and it's, it's two different perspectives on this. But before then... Human beings, humanity was created to run, we were created to run after our food and capture it. We were created to desire something and run after it. And so I want to connect this, this basic human nature when it comes to wanting to eat our food. We were created to run after spiritual things, to, to hunt for them, to search for them, to run in a race, uh, to, to, to go after them in such a way and capture it and receive it and to experience it in such a real way. And whether that's a cauliflower metaphor or a steak to you, whichever one you wanna be on the side of, we, we were created to run after him and experience intimacy in relationship with him. But here's what happens. Sometimes the more we walk with God, the less hungry we get and we're not running the race anymore. We're just waiting on it to be delivered by Instacart to the house. Ding dong. Supper's here, and we're wanting it to be delivered to us on a platter instead of this desire every day waking up with a desire, God, I've got to encounter you. God, I need you today. God, I want to know you more than I knew you yesterday. I, I, I need his, his presence. I need to know him in this way. We are supposed to be getting ready for heaven, not waiting on heaven. We're supposed to be preparing ourselves in a way that, man, to see him is to be like him. I'm not just trying to barely make it in the door out of breath. I want to run my race right in the door. And again, not because I've accomplished so much or I'm so good or, or any of that, but just I've learned a life of walking and living in his presence. And for those of you that may not have a relationship with Jesus or, or maybe you're, you're looking at, at starting one and this is like, man, this sounds awesome. You can start right today. And while that little relationship will develop, he gives you all of himself in that moment when you believe and you trust in him. So some of us think that, well, it's a long way off. Well, when, I, when I've been serving God as long as this person or, or as long as this person, then I'll be able to experience presence, the presence of God in that way. No, we see Jesus show up in people's lives, people who are so far from him. And in an instant and in a moment, they're experiencing face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord. And that is true for us too. So while it is a relationship, it's not something that we earn or that, that we, but you know, that, that, that we've got to earn out of our goodness that we're bringing to God. No, it's just something we simply receive. And then day in and day out, I'm walking in this relationship with him. 
I hope I'm encouraging you in your race today. I came to preach. I don't know if you came to, to, to receive it, but, but I've, come, I've come to preach today. Let's look at Moses. Moses was a guy in the old Bible. I like to call him Mo. And Moses was running his own race. He actually grew up a prince in Egypt. He was Jewish. He was, he was an Israelite. And, and through a, this really orchestration of God, his life was saved. And he was actually raised in the house of, of uh, the, the leaders of Egypt. And so a little bit of backstory, he grew into a man, but then he saw the way his people were treated. Israel, the people of God, were in slavery in Egypt. And so Moses, in his passion, he saw one of, his, one of his brothers, one of his people being beaten, and he had had enough. There was this righteous indignation. There was this thing inside of him that said, this is something that is but should not be. We were all born with that. Some of us put it to sleep. Some of us aren't aware of it anymore. We think that, that, that it's not there or no, I, I wasn't born with that. No, you were born with, for a purpose and a reason to, to, to run a race that God assigned for you. Moses heard the call of that, but he ran it in his own way. I wonder how many people are trying to do what God called them to do in their own way, and their race ran them on the backside of the mountain thinking they have to do it without God. And that's where Moses found himself. When God found him, Moses had actually murdered an Egyptian. It was like, I don't know if, if you can mix morality like this. He, it, was, it was for the, the, the purpose of protecting, but it was still murder. Moses, who was supposed to be running his race for God, became a murderer. So it's not Moses the deliverer. It's not Moses the runner after God. It's Moses the murderer. His identity was shaped because of how he tried to run his race in his own way. So I just want you to understand, he's desperate. He's defeated. He's inadequate. He's guilty. Like all of these things. Did Moses murder somebody or not? Yeah, so he's guilty. Like All of these things are true about him. Moses had every human excuse not to run his race anymore. So he had ran to the backside of the mountain. He was keeping his father-in-law's sheep. And so he decided, I'm gonna do this occupation. I'm gonna do a different thing. I'm gonna hide myself in the backside of the desert. And guess who found Moses in the backside of the desert? Because it doesn't matter how far you run your own race, God will always find you. His eye is looking at you. His purpose doesn't end for you. And when you're not running towards God, God is running towards you. And that's the beauty of this relationship with him. Tomorrow morning after Sunday's over, you're going to wake up. Guess who is running after relationship with you? It's the Sunday school answer. You ready? What did the kids learn in Sunday school? Jesus. Who's running after you with a passionate heart? Jesus. Guess who's not disappointed in you? Jesus. Guess who loves you? Jesus. Guess who never leaves you nor forsakes you? Jesus. We could go home on that right now. But I prepared more, so sit tight. <laughs> Jesus. So Moses has this encounter with God on the backside of the desert, and it's in the form, check this out, it's in the form of a burning bush. I don't know what it was about about bushes, but... There was a burning bush, and it got Moses' attention. Moses runs to the other side, of it and he goes, man, look at that. There's a bush. It's burning, but this one isn't consumed. And then out of that, so Moses looked up. Come on, we're looking up. He walks over towards the bush, and he begins to have conversation with the bush. It reminds me of the three musketeers, the singing bush. But God begins to interact and speak to Moses. Moses begins to speak to God, and I want us to look at that interaction and learn some things about our race. Check this out. Moses was an Old Testament hero, but not always. When God found him, he was running his own race, and then when God begins to encounter him and Moses begins to encounter God, this is really cool. This is what happens. Verse four, this is Exodus three. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. Now watch this. God spoke to get Moses' attention. But it was when God saw that Moses had gone over to look, something happened. God is always looking at us. But there's something that happens when we look to him. 
There's something that clicks spiritually. There's something, it's not that we make God do something that he wouldn't do otherwise. It's not that God, God is all, already poised in position to bless you, to encounter you, to experience you. God doesn't have anything on his to-do list. Well, I need to do this. No, God, God is ready, poised, ready. It's us who need to take the step. And when we look up, something begins to happen. Everybody say, look up. So check this out. It says, when he had gone over to look up, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here is the statement of our lives, here I am. All of a sudden, boom, relationship is sparked. All of a sudden, there's this encounter, there's this thing, and you say, well, that's just a sentence. No, 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 no. When God saw Moses look up, then God spoke, and we, we or Moses responded to the voice of God, and he said, here I am. See, see, you don't understand. There's a lot of people that God gets their attention, but it's a whole nother level to say, here I am. There's a lot of people that watch what God does and want to run their race, but they never say the statement, here I am. Here I am. That, what does this communicate? Communicates, here's, I, I don't know about you, I don't, haven't seen a lot of burning bushes, but if a burning bush is talking, I'm not running to it, I'm running away from it. Or I'm figuring out how to, how to make this Insta story and tell everybody about this, check this thing out, you need to come. Just imagine if there was social media in the Bible times. Wow. Trying to capture this moment but man, here's Moses, and he begins to encounter the Lord. And there's a, a couple of things that I, that I believe Moses learned in just this very small interaction. Because it, it's pretty cool. There's other things that obviously happen between Moses and his relationship. But you got to look at the beginning. you got to look at the origin. Like what, what was happening in this conversation at the very beginning that caused Moses to eventually run his race and be the hero that we know stood in front of Pharaoh and stood in front of the, the Red Sea and, 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 and all of these different things that we know about the hero of Moses. I can't wait to meet him one day. How about you? Bump knuckles with Moses, that's gonna be cool. I picture that he's really tall. Maybe he'll be short. But I picture it's like, hey, Mo. It's probably gonna be me with both Bible characters in the Bible, except for Zacchaeus, because he was a wee little guy. Okay, so. Uh, but, but Moses encounters him, and there's these, a couple of things I want us to get out of this as we run our race. He's broken, he's insecure, he's inadequate, but God calls him to run. You might be broken, hurt, insecure, inadequate, but God calls you to run your race. And before you were ever running to him, he comes running to us. And he calls us out of his presence, the voice of his presence, and all he's looking for, it isn't what you bring to him, but it's simply your availability. Not your great accomplishments, not your... Listen, Moses was, was broken. Some of us think that our brokenness makes us disqualified to run our race. What if God turns the brokenness into a qualification for you to help somebody else run their race? What if, even though he didn't send it, what if the healing and the restoration that you experience in your relationship with him makes you stronger, not weaker? What if the more you yield to him with this simple statement of here I am, what if it helps you and empowers you to run your race in a way that you never thought possible? The first thing that God tells Moses is I am here. He's the great I am. Moses was saying, God, I'm the great I'm not. But God told Moses, I'm the great I am. And, and how, do, how do we know this? He says, I, I just want to, I don't want to read it. It's all in Exodus 3 for you to look at. But 
But God had promised Moses a lot of things he, because there's this interaction and Moses begins to tell God why he can't do what he has asked him to do. He, he says, I'm not this, I'm not that. And so God promises him some, some things. He promised him a spokesman. He said, listen, you don't have to talk. I'm going to use Aaron to talk because Moses actually, we, we learn from historians and through the Bible, is that he had a stuttering problem. And so Moses was insecure about what he, he thought, I mean, you want me to be the spokesman and, and I can't. I struggle publicly speaking. I can't do this. And so God says, okay, well, I'm going to provide somebody to do that. And so he, he, God promised all these tools for him to accomplish the race that he was supposed to run. But more important than all of those things, God promised Moses himself. What makes our run so special isn't the promises of God in the sense of all the things that he will give to us. It's not the hand of God, it's the heart of God. It's the fact that God said, I'm gonna run this race with you. The, the, the greatest answer to inadequacy is not, not some tool to cope with it, but the very presence of God that's with me in the inadequacy. Where I'm inadequate, where I'm not, and that's simply what inadequacy or insecurity is, where I am not, we can bring all our I'm nots to God, but he is the great I am. How do we see this illustrated in Moses' life <laughs> or, 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 or their interaction? God says, as, for, as soon as Moses runs over to see the burning bush, he goes, wow, here's God speaking out of the burning bush, and he goes, here I am. What's the next thing that God tells him? He goes, boy, you better take off your shoes. What? Take off, take off my shoes? You better take off your shoes. And why? Because God said the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Now, hold on a second. What makes the ground holy? It wasn't Moses. It was the fact that God showed up on the ground that made it holy. Some of us are wanting the areas that we're running our race to be holy. But it's not your holiness or your togetherness or your adequacy or your ability that makes the ground sacred and holy. It's the fact that God is there in the middle of it. You want your marriage to be holy? You better take off your shoes. You want your church to be holy? You better take off your shoes. You want the circumstance and the situation to be sacred unto the Lord? Take off your shoes because where he is is holy ground. Well, no, 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 no. You, you don't know what's going on in my house right now, Michael. It ain't holy ground. Take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. What, what does this ground, or what does taking off our shoes represent? It, it, it represents there this very simple statement. Listen, the answer to all our I'm not isn't yes you can. Well, I can't do this, God. I can't run my race. I can't accomplish this. And we want to hear God say, let's just get honest. We want to hear God say, yes, you can. But the answer to our persistent I can't isn't yes, you can, but it's I am, I will, and I am here with you right now. So many times in the midst of it, we have these experiences with God, uh, an experience of humility, experience where we hear something. Anybody ever heard God say something to you? I mean, it just touches you. And Okay, good, four of us have heard God. That's awesome. So this year, we're going to hear God more, okay? So we hear him and something, out, I mean, he talks out of some way. He speaks to us. We say, here I am, but here's what we do. We go, Ooh, do, 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 do. I need to put my shoes on. I need my shoehorn. To help with my shoes, I'm going to lace up my shoes, and I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to go to school, and I'm going to go to university, and I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to run my race. I'm going to lace it up. And maybe the determining factor of you winning and running your race the way he's designed it isn't you lacing up your shoes and running harder but taking your shoes off in humility and recognizing. My number one goal is to look up and make a place for the great I am. Making a place for his presence. This ground is holy 
ground. Then they begin to talk. There's this interaction that begins to happen between him and Moses. And he shows him a a burning bush. The interesting thing about the bush and the voice that's coming out of that is is that it's a bush that doesn't burn up. So it's not just something on fire. It's something that isn't consumed. You know, burnout, the, the World Health Organization just a couple of years ago decided that burnout was actually a diagnosis for like a, a prognosis for people in their lives. That, and, and I want you to just think about the word burnout. And this was most of the time, not just in life, but with people's jobs. So here's what happens. People get burnout in their marriage, so they find another marriage. People get burnout in their jobs, so they think they're not in the right job, so they find another job. People get burnout at their church, and so instead of figuring out, okay, what's, the, what's maybe the common denominator or what's going on, then what do we want to do? We either fight or flight. So there's this reaction to the feeling of burnout, and a lot of us run, run from that. And so I'm not saying we need to let's be overwhelmed and just suck it up. Sometimes that's the answer, but, but what's the real answer to burnout? Maybe, maybe it's not what we're doing, but it's the source that we're using to motivate us or to strengthen us on the run that we're, the race that we're running. So what, what was the burning bush? It was a burning bush that never burned out. Moses, can we just say he was burnt out? Like way before the World Health Organization was organized and stuff, Moses didn't, we didn't need somebody to tell us that Moses was burnt out. He was on the backside of the desert running his race from God. He was a murderer. He was inadequate. He was insecure. But something got his attention. God got his attention. He ran over to him. Now he's in a place of humility. His shoes are off. And he's, he's submitted to the Lord. And then the Lord begins to speak to him from a bush. What is God saying to Moses? What is God saying to us in our race? Maybe when we feel tired, worn, and burnt out, that, that it's not even a different race that we need to be running, but it's a different source that we need to be depending on. Here was a bush that was burning that never stopped burning, that kept burning. And the same thing comes out of the bush is I am the great I am. Moses, where you're not, I am. It's not always the wrong race. Sometimes it's the wrong source. Moses said, that sounds good to me. But what about me? And here's the same thing that Moses kept coming back to. I'm not this. I'm not that. I I can't do this. I, I don't have what I need to do this. I'm wondering if, if, if Moses felt like he needed to tell God what he had done, like he didn't know. Moses, did, did, God, did, did, you, did you know that I did this? Did you know that I, this is the way I think? This is who I am? And so what Moses constantly does is he looks at himself. And when we look at ourselves and we look only in front of us, what does it begin to do? It creates this fatigue in our running, in our race. And we're just looking at what's right in front of us. And if we want to run a race, we got to keep our head up. We got to look ahead. We got to see a source that doesn't burn out. If if I'm feeling weakness, Paul says that in my weakness, you are strong. If I'm feeling insecurity in my lack, he is the God that is more than enough. We have a whole philosophy that says that we need to look in will be your best you. Let's look in. That that's not a new trending philosophy that is an old way Adam and Eve started looking in to themselves and stopped looking up there's a lot that we're dealing with in the world today and sometimes we're looking for the answer how am I going to make it through how are we going to do this no no that that's not the answer that's not our source the source is in the bush that doesn't burn out the source is in a God who doesn't doesn't need things to work out a certain way for him to be God he is God no matter what he's God on the mountain he's God in the valley 
And so how, how do I bring, how, how do I make a place for a God who can do anything and a God who is, a, is, is the fire that never burns out? I take off my shoes. I gotta make a place for taking off my shoes. I, I don't know how many times, you know, we don't see that Moses actually took off his sandals. But there's these moments where Moses does these incredible things and we see these feats that, that God is, it's, it's miraculous what, what God does. Those are moments where Moses takes off his shoes. He says, I may be standing in front of the people, I may be leading the people, but it's not me, this is you. You are the great I am. And any time we make a place for the great I am, he does what the great I am not can do. Can do. What we can't do, what, what we can't accomplish in our own strength, in our own race, man, he can accomplish. Moses, on the back of the mountain, was in an identity crisis. Even after he sees the burning bush and a, a fire that never runs out, even after he's taking off his shoes, he's still in an identity crisis. He's still struggling with who he isn't. And I love this. What did God give Moses to shape his identity? It wasn't Moses. It wasn't you've got what you need. It wasn't even, even things that are great. I've made you for this moment. Yes, you can. Well, it wasn't any of that. God gave Moses his word. He gave you his word. What, what never changes? Sometimes my feelings are going to change, but his word never changes. And, and here's what happens. What does that mean for us? Moses got his identity. He, the reason he was in identity crisis is because he has got his, his identity from what he had done or what he did. We don't get our identity from our performance. We get our identity from his presence. My, Watch this. Sometimes my performance is going to be awesome. Sometimes it's going to stink. So sometimes you're, uh, people do this in their occupation. Think about this. It's, 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 like, it's like, who are you? What do you do? It's almost the first thing that we ask about each other. Hey, what do you do for a living? And then sometimes we feel this pressure depending on the environment that we're in. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a communicator. I'm a... I'm this, you know, depending on, because if we're, if we're not careful, we find our identity in what we do. So many times we find our identity in what we bring to God instead of finding our identity in the God, what he brings to us and that we belong to him, that he created us. Why is this important? Because you will slap dab, run your race to the backside of the desert in an identity crisis because you don't know who you are. You'll be 40 years running your race, but still not know who you are. Let's judge other people for a minute, not ourselves, okay? But we all know people. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious. We all know people who are still trying to figure out who they are through their career, through their relationship. Through... Husband, it's not your wife's job to tell you who you are. It's your relationship with God and from his presence. Mom and dad, it's not the behavior of your kids or their function or dysfunction that determines who you are. Right now, you're dealing with a, a chronic sickness. Listen, that chronic sickness doesn't have the right to tell you what your identity is and who you are. You, you see what I'm saying? Listen, I, I just declare over the people of God, we will not let a pandemic or anything else from the pit of hell tell us who we are and what we're going to be. Our identity doesn't come from sickness, from death from what the enemy comes to do to kill, steal, and destroy. Our identity and our purpose is safely seated and rooted in the great I am. And when you got the sniffles and 102 fever and you can't taste anything, stay at home. Deal with it. Do what you can. Use wisdom. Navigate through, but don't stop running your race. Don't stop running your, don't, don't, don't start thinking, oh, well, the, the, you know, things are shifting, things are volatile. Think, yes, they always have been. It's just gonna come in a new way or a different, different way. It's gonna show itself in a different way. It's gonna be the difference of shadow of turning. But there is one who there is no shadow of turning. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I run my race with him. 
And I'm not going to let two years of craziness cause me to run myself on the backside of the desert, hiding from the purpose that God has given me. I've got an assignment on my life. You've got an assignment on your life to run with his presence. There is a source that never burns out. Well, I've, I feel like that, that World Health Organization uh, prognosis, I feel like I'm going to burn out. You better get with Jesus. You better burn up in his presence. Well, no, 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 I, I don't think I can. You better take off your shoes because where you can, he can. So many times we start off our prayers with, I'm not. God is not worried about what you're not. He wants you to look up. Moses, look up. Moses, look up. Yeah, but God, I, 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 I can't. I, I, I don't know. But do, do you know what I did? Moses, look up. It's almost as if God interrupted everything that Moses had to say to tell him to look up. Maybe on the second week of January, God just wants to interrupt you right in the middle of what you're doing and say, look up. Stop looking around. Stop looking back. Look up. And so many times we, we got our shoes laced up. Come on, we got some new runners for Christmas, and we're like over here, well, once I fix this, then once I fix this, and once I get my kids together, and once the, the COVID goes away, the COVID, the COVID goes away, and once this goes away, and, and once this happens over here, and we're running side to side, and Jesus is standing there going. Let's go. Let's go. We got work to do. There's a world that's lost and hurting. Run your race. But you don't know what I did. You don't know what it was happening. You don't know what I'm not. He goes, listen, I am not worried about what you're not. I am the great I am. And he tells Moses that. Look at this. I broke it down in just a, this is from three different verses. He said, I will be with you. I promise you that I will bring you up and I will be your mouth. I will, I will, I will. Look up, Moses. So the answer to our persistent pattern of I can't isn't yes, you can. But it's I can, I will, and I am. He is. There's this statement. You've probably heard us say it before. But you become what you behold. I just want to ask you, not what are you going to do this year, not what are you going to accomplish so many things that we're going to do and so many things that we're going to accomplish. But who are we looking at? Let's look up today. Let's look up. What you, what you behold is what you become. And I don't want to become the stuff that's around us. I don't want to find my identity in that. We find our identity in the one who paid, it, paid the price for us. There is a, he is a source that never runs dry. He, all my fountains are in him. Drink, he says, drink of me and you will never go thirsty again. You, you thirsty today? You feeling burnt out? You feeling pressed on every side? Just look up. Well, I just need to make it go away. Uh, uh look up. Set your attention, set your focus on him. You bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe you're here today and you've never looked up. Maybe your attention has never been set on the Lord. The Bible says that when we believe in him, when we trust in him, when we confess him with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is Lord, that that's where salvation comes. That's, and that's where it begins, this beautiful relationship with Jesus. But it also means that when we die and finish our race here, that we'll see him face to face. Heaven is a real place. Hell is a real place. And you were never designed. Our eternity was never purposed to be hell. We were designed and created to be with Jesus and be in relationship with him. And so if you don't have that relationship, man, we want to close out the day by giving you an opportunity to pray that prayer. Nobody's looking around. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. That's, that's just so that you're not embarrassed. This is really between you and God. Right now, you may be watching online and, and that's you. You just say, Michael, I need to start out my year. I need this relationship with Jesus. And maybe you've prayed this prayer before, but, but you know you need to come back home. You need a fresh start in your relationship with him. Either one of those two decisions, I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand so I know that that's you and you can put it right back down. If I'm praying for you today and you say, Michael, I need Jesus today, will you pray with me? Will you just lift your hand up and put it right back down? Say, yes, that's me today. Thank you. Thank you. 
If you're watching online, you can put it in the comment bar right there. Yes, today I need Jesus. Thank you. Way to go. Way to go. Best thing you can do is look up. I'm going to give you some words to pray right now as you just surrender your life to him. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe you're speaking to me today. And I surrender my life to you. I take my shoes off, humble myself, and I say, where I can't, you can. Come be my Lord. Come be my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for beating death and beating sin. I believe on the third day you rose again. And you are seated alive and well in heaven. Thank you that one day I'll see you face to face. Thank you that I can run my race face to face with you in a relationship. Come fill me with your purpose, with your life. Thank you that I don't take one step without you. That you're the way, the truth, and the life. And today, you're mine. You belong to me, I belong to you. I love you, Jesus. Thank you so much for loving me. In your name I pray, amen.